Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. This time out, we are joined by Ben Lilly, Technical Sales and Applications Engineer at ATC. That's Thanks right. for coming in. How do you do, Mitch? Great to have you here. Thank all you. the way over from uh, England. Yep, flew in a couple of days ago. Nice. Well, we're glad to have you back at Sweetwater. You've been here before. Yep, th third visit now. Right. Now, how long have you been with ATC? Uh, I've been with ATC uh, 11 years now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so started out in uh, design and engineering, and just recently we've had a couple of changes at the company. So I'm um, now uh, working as technical sales and applications. So if you like, I suppose the simplest way to explain it is um, link between the end users and uh, design and development. Okay. Um, and taking care of some of the sales and marketing. Right, right. So you were involved early on with the design of some of the speakers and and uh, yeah, and the last. Um, let me think. So how many products? Uh, three, four. A range of hi-fi products, um, and more recently for the professional market, uh, the SCM25, a uh, three-way right. studio monitor, and our newest active monitor, uh, the SCM20. Right, which just uh, was introduced fairly recently, right? Yeah, we're just demoing that today. Right, right. So tell us about that speaker. Uh, so it's, um, it's a new version of an existing model, the SCM20, so it's a two-way, mm -hmm. uh, six-inch based uh, active loudspeaker. Uh, using all of our own components and it's a bit of a first for us. Uh, we've always made our own bass and mid-range drivers, mm -hmm. uh, but for the last six years we've been working on our own high-frequency drive unit. And the new SCM20 is the first pro uh, level monitor to feature that new part. Mm -hmm. So we, it's actually the first active loudspeaker where we're producing every single component in the loudspeaker. Wow. So. So we're pretty proud of and everyone's yeah. been really excited about it. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's, that's been a drive for a long time to you know, be in charge of all the components. So mm -hmm. Every component we want to be in charge of how it's engineered, the philosophy behind it um, and how it's put together. And I suppose the goal is to main, maintain the, you know, a, a, the ATC sound signature across the entire range and across all of the components. Right, right. Is that because the components you were getting from other manufacturers weren't consistent, or what were you running into with the uh, with the other uh, components? When you're OEM sourcing, you're all there's always going to be an element of. Uh, I mean, if you've got big buying power, you can sometimes have exactly what you want. But we're we're a smaller company. Mm -hmm. um, you're there, you're always going to have to make a couple of compromises, um, I think, and, and you can't always have it exactly how you want. Um, and also by um, engineering all your own components, you're not paying someone margin right. on that component. So you can uh, either offer higher performance at the same price point or, or better value mm -hmm. uh, for money. So we tried to do both of that. So you know, to, uh, the new tweeter we've just bought out um, for one of the lower price range price ranges um, to buy that part in would probably would not have been economical to do. So we've been able to offer much higher performance without a price increase. Right. And will we see those uh, those drivers then migrating to the other models in the line as well? Yes, yeah, slowly. Um, we're working at the moment on just making sure that the new models uh, have, the, have the new part fitted. And then in the future, there will be upgrade kits rolled out for existing users. Mm -hmm. um, we try to look after our older customers and ensure there's an upgrade path um, Especially on the you know the high, larger high performance models. Right, right, nice, nice. That are obviously quite a significant investment. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And uh, I mean, we regularly see loudspeakers back in the factory that are twenty plus years old that have been out you know doing lots of lots of many years hard work. Come back in, we'll service them, uh, replace the drive units, upgrade the components if that's available, and you know send them back to the customer. Oh, that's great. With the latest spec. Yeah, right, right. So, what kind of a background do you have that that uh, brought you into doing this? Uh, I suppose at, at school and college I was always into music um, mm -hmm. and, and science, but uh, I was definitely was stronger on the science side of things. So um, when it, it came to looking at college courses, um, audio technology was something that interested me. Mm -hmm. um, so I studied a course at Salford University, uh, which is one of the main two centres in the UK that have a strong acoustics background, the other one being Southampton. Okay. Um, I did two years there, um, I had the option to do a sandwich course. Uh, then went and worked for Genelec in Finland for 12 months, mm -hmm. uh, which was great experience working with the, with the guys out there. Right. And then came back, uh, finished my final year, and following on from that, I did some work experience and a couple of summer placements uh, with some acoustic consultancies. Mm -hmm. uh, the main one being Arup, a big engineering consultancy mm -hmm. in the UK, uh, before starting at ATC. Right, right. So you're really bringing an acoustician's mindset to the speaker design along with the, the, the mechanical, the, you know, the electrical side. Yeah, I think so. I think you don't think you can discount that part of it. I mean, the, when you're 
making the test and the measurement of the loudspeakers, you use anechoic conditions or a large room or you know gated measurement techniques to hone in on the loudspeaker, but you can't you can't take away the room from the loudspeaker. They you know, with for the final user they're interacting as a system and you have to I think uh, a good loudspeaker engineer um, has a good understanding of the acoustic environment and the uh, m electromechanical systems in the loudspeaker system. Right, right. So what is the philosophy that you work toward as far as the monitors go? Are you, are you going for something that will fit any room? Are you going for a particular sound? What are you, what are you looking at? Uh, that's probably the simplest way is to describe it as neutral fidelity. That may mm -hmm. make sense. Um, we, I think that our systems are often used in probably higher spec rooms with decent acoustics. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't offer quite as many feature sets as some of the other manufacturers um, offer in terms of frequency shaping because mm -hmm. uh, we've got a strong belief that the direct sound from the speaker should be correct. Uh, you have a flat, a flat frequency response, um, low distortion, um, and before the room interacts with it. So, and having all these frequency shaping controls does compromise the direct sound mm -hmm. uh, somewhat. And yeah, I suppose we go for a neutral fidelity would be the, the, the best description and just trying to apply best engineering practice to uh, what is already known. You know, the loudspeakers, are, you know, they were using a, quite an old, uh, you know, moving coil loudspeakers. It's a you know, well-known technology. Right. Um, and I think despite what some, some things you may read in some marketing um, and technical publications, um, the wheel hasn't been reinvented, as it were, <laughs> to, uh, uh, that much in the, you know, in the last, uh, if at all. Um, it's still the same principle, but, but uh, by applying material science and better engineering practice to what's already known, uh, mm -hmm. trying to engineer a better loudspeaker with neutral fidelity. Right, so the idea is that what's coming out of the speaker at the speaker is... is is correct. Is correct, and yeah. then your room should be basically adjusted. If you yeah, will. I mean it's it's not what everyone wants to hear because room treatment can be difficult um, mm -hmm. and expensive. Um, but if you want the best possible re results, you need a high performance loudspeaker uh, that's got a, you know flat frequency response, low distortion, wide dispersion um, in a room uh, that also performs well. Right. Right. Um, if you then start trying to uh, correct the loudspeaker for the rooms. Uh, problems, uh, especially in the mid and high frequency, you often run into, into trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only equalize for half a wavelength space. Um, so once you get up to the high frequency, you know, you're talking this sort of air size area. Right. So unless you're happy to sit dead center and not move anywhere around the listening room, um, maybe that's, that's practical for a smaller project studio, but not in a commercial facility right. um, with a large board. Uh, so yeah, the best possible results are always going to come from a high-performance loudspeaker in a well-designed space. Mm -hmm. You visit a lot of studios. Do you see a common problem in most of them, or is there something that you, you just about always run into? I think the smaller project studios that are treated with you know, the kit type form acoustic treatment, uh, usually badly placed, badly fitted. Mm -hmm. most, the most typical problems are usually low frequency. You know, if you take um, um, a project studio, maybe it's got carpeted floor, it's not that big, uh, you've got some chairs, tables, um, it's going to, in the mid and high frequency, it's going to be fairly diffuse, there's maybe a few problem reflections, but they'd be quite easy to deal with. Most of the problems are usually in the low frequency, um, right. and often with the kits, um, you kind of stick a panel on the wall type thing, they often only really treat the, the mid uh, and the lower mid still leaving the base exposed. And what can happen is by, by overdoing those kits, you end up damping all the frequencies that aren't that problematic, and then you have a greater difference, if you like, between the, the, the slow, uh, poorly decayed low frequency and the mid and high frequency. Right, so really if someone wants to optimize a room, particularly a smaller room, they need to focus on that bottom F end. Focus on the low frequency first, yeah. Try and get, try and get that um, solved, because the, the mid and high frequency problems are often easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and if you that if you deal with try dealing with the mid range first, and then then also then dealt with the low frequency problems afterwards, you might end up with too dead a space. Um, I mean, some people don't mind working in, in spaces like that, but you know the kind of typical control room that was maybe around in the 70s, you know, just tons of fiberglass everywhere. I don't find those that comfortable to right. sit, work, and 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 listen in. Mm -hmm. I think you can achieve something that's more. Uh, that's closer to a, um, a domestic environment. So it's going to be de slightly deader than that, but it's a, you know, take that, 
take that room from the 70s, you know, without the problem, the reflective, reflective problems, without the low frequency problem, problems, and just try and create that, but with a slightly longer right, reverb time that's mm -hmm. more comfortable to work in. Right, I right. Think, I think that would be a good goal. Mm -hmm. How much uh, reverb time do you recommend for a control room design like that? Um, I would have thought, I think the rooms I probably have experienced that are more uncomfortable to sit in personally, they're probably close to sort of 0 0.2, 0 0.3, something more 0 0.3, 0 0.4, Mm -hmm. 0.5, that sort of area is probably more com more comfortable. Well. Yeah, right. um, and then as long as you know the early reflections and the modes are, are well controlled, um, I think that's prob. And the reverb times even with frequency, so your your low frequency is decaying at a similar rate to the mid and high. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably more more important than a specific RT goal. Okay, okay. And how how much does speaker placement within the room play into that? Uh, it's in a room with without much treatment, mm -hmm. um, it's probably more critical. Typically, I found the better the room, uh, the better the damping of the low frequency, the, a little more, the room is a little more forgiving of, of placement. Uh, with the rooms with strong, strong modes, strong low frequency problems, usually the, moving the loudspeakers around has a big, big impact. Right, right. So just getting them farther from the wall, getting them out of corners, yeah, those kinds the, of things. Yeah, that helps enormously. So, right. um, I mean, if you've got a very small loudspeaker uh, if you, and lacking bass, if you push them out towards the room boundaries, towards the corners, you're going to get more bass that maybe that's something you have to have. But it'll also mean that more room modes are excited mm -hmm. uh, and it may take longer to decay. Mm -hmm. So probably clo speakers closer to the walls, more quantity, but not necessarily more, more quality. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So do you design the different speaker models with a size of room in mind? Is the SM20 for a certain size of room and the 25 for a different size of room? It's, no, it's not really part of the, um, the criteria. Mm -hmm. um, it would be, we'd, we'd, we're more likely to uh, make recommendations on room size once the system's finished. We wouldn't say we need a system for a specific room size. Okay. Um, typically it would be, um, our, our systems are designed around lo low frequency response and, and SPL output. And all we try to do as we move up the range is that you, you get the, uh, the neutral fidelity of an, of an ATC system, but as you move up a model, you achieve more extended low frequency and a higher sound pressure level capability. Mm -hmm. And do you need a certain size room to be able to perceive that lower frequency? Do you have to have a full wavelength room? Uh, it, to get full natural reproduction of those long wavelengths, yeah, the bigger rooms help. Right. Uh, if uh, the room is too small uh, to support the wavelength, then you just get an increase in pressure. Uh, you don't get the traveling uh, wave moving around the room. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and also with a smaller room, the problems are that the uh, room resonances are spaced further apart in frequency. So, with a with a small room, your first set, if your first mode's at thirty, mm -hmm. um, your spacing's then going to be your second one's going to be at sixty spacing sends 30 hertz. If you've got a large room where your first mode is at say 10 or 15 cycles, that's your spacing. So the bigger the room, the closer the modal density and the more even the frequency response typically. Right. There's always, you know. Uh, All other things being equal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah you'll <laughs> always get the anomaly, of, you know, the, the big room that sounds awful, but right. <laughs> general rule of thumb, if the ratios of the, you know, the dimensions, height, width, depth are good, then uh, the bigger room has usually got a more even and natural low frequency response. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's all great information. Thanks for coming in and sharing all that with us. Yeah, quite all right. We're excited about the SCM20s. The speakers sound awesome. Cool, so thank you very much. Incredible stuff. I have the 25s in my studio. I absolutely love them. They're incredible. Well, you've been out. You've seen the... Uh, yeah, no, that's a lovely. That's, a, that's very well done, that room. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And we appreciate you being here at Sweetwater. Thanks for coming out to visit us. Great. Thank you. Good to see you, Ben. Thanks. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.